Thank you, uh, Prof. Chaturvedi. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm actually here by default, but uh, very privileged to be part of this rich discussion and excellent uh, presentation by Dr. Ghosh. I just want to make a few comments. In 2018, when South Africa chaired BRICS, one of the outcomes of the BRICS summit uh, by the leaders was the setting up of the BRICS Vaccine Research Center in South Africa. We're busy with that uh, process of setting up that BRICS Vaccine Research Center, and I hope that we'll see some uh, collaboration in future between the BRICS Vaccine Research Center and the excellent work being done by yourself. I'm glad you touched also on, on uh, accessibility and affordability. Uh, of vaccines. South Africa is a direct recipient of this. As you know, we have one of the largest percentages of uh, our people infected with HIV AIDS. And the challenge for us was uh, access and affordability. And as a result of us being able to source low-cost vaccines from India, today South Africa has the largest uh, antiretroviral rollout program globally and we are a direct beneficiary of that. And within the G20, as you know, we are busy with the, the antimicrobial resistance program, where South Africa is one of the co-chairs. And there, again, we are looking at the issue of uh, research collaboration and the involvement of poor countries, development, uh, developing countries, in the whole cycle, from, from research down to production uh, processes. So I think it's very important that as countries of the South and developing countries, we become self-sufficient. We saw the challenges in Africa when we had major outbreak of pandemics. We were left helpless and we had to depend on the global community to come and assist us. So developing our own capacity, working amongst ourselves as countries of the South, also working in partnership with the developed North, uh, I think is a very important part of this collaboration. Uh, we are very privileged to have a very distinguished group of panelists today to further elaborate on this topic. So I know we are running a bit behind time, so I will call upon each panelist to take about uh, six to seven minutes to make your interventions. So we have some time for some dynamic interaction thereafter. So our first panelist is Prof. Vijay Chandru, member, Associate Association Biotechnology-led enterprise. Over to you, uh, Professor you. Chandru. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. So um, I'm certainly happy to be here. Uh, I, I do represent the industry. I you know, built a, a genomics company and was the president of the Association for Biotech-Led Industry uh, for, we, we have three-year terms, so I was the president from 2009 to 12. And in those years, we really sort of focused a lot on biosimilars as, as sort of a, a, a major thrust uh, area that, that uh, you know, the country needed to, to work towards. And I think we are sort of seeing a lot of the benefits uh, of uh, that interaction with government and uh, 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 now. But uh, the, the, the focus on vaccines, I think, has... Uh, has always been there and an undercurrent in, in the industry, um, you know, plans and uh, interactions with its membership. Um, I think, uh, you know, first I'd like to uh, congratulate uh, Dr. Ghosh for, for a very comprehensive report. Uh, I was, uh, I received it a couple of days ago and, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was great to, to go through the the details and as 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 I think uh, you know comes out com comes across very clearly in the report and and in his presentation today, um, the Indian industry for uh, you know in the in the vaccine sector um, is a substantive player. By value, we may be you know five percent or or so, but uh, actual impact and uh, you know the physical sort of vaccine production, which, uh, you know, has a much higher impact, and particularly in, um, you know, in the developing sector uh, in the third world, you know, I think we, we certainly have a, a, a major impact. And, uh, and, you know, and I think, uh, of course, our internal, 
you know, healthcare issues were also brought up. I think uh, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, at about $35 or so, uh, we can provide a kind of minimal program, uh, which, you know, would convert to somewhere close to a billion dollars if, if you were to really, you know, extend that minimum program to every child in the country. And, uh, and the industry is at about a $2 billion uh, uh, a year, you know, top line. So, so, I mean, it's within reach. It's, it's something that uh, certainly aspirationally from a public health perspective, I think uh, we would lo love to see the government sort of reach, uh, reach every child with some of these vaccines. Of course, uh, you know, there's a much higher uh, target with, uh, with the $500 per child uh, sort of uh, ultimate sort of vaccine plan, which, which I think is, uh, uh, you know, it requires a much bigger outlay and, uh, and has to be thought about in a very different way. Um, I, I just want to point out that in addition to many of the research programs that uh, Dr. Ghosh mentioned that are happening around the country, um, there is a kind of, uh, I, I work in the city of Bangalore, and Bangalore actually has a kind of a, uh, a self-organizing kind of research and development culture where, where the industry and academics and government, sort of local government, uh, works together and uh, works with the philanthropists, many of the, the new technology um, czars, <laughs> you know, of, of, uh, of the region are willing to fund uh, research projects. So we have a very interesting project on, on a, a metagenomic-based approach to, to actual vaccine design uh, for dengue, uh, which is led by a virologist from the National Center for Biological Sciences, who's also a physician, Dr. Sudhir Krishna. And we work with, uh, uh, you know, there, there's, a, there's a consortium that has come together and it's been funded largely by uh, Mr. Narayan Murthy, who is uh, one of the founders of uh, Infosys. And, uh, and, you know, I think we're very close to a very nice vaccine construct, uh, which, uh, which can be taken forward. Um, now, the interesting thing that's happened in that project is that we are already working with Africa. And uh, so we have a close collaboration with Kavi uh, the, in, uh, in Nairobi. And we've made now several visits. A lab has been set up in Kavi to mirror the labs in Bangalore. And, and so, you know, there's actually going to be interesting technology transfer that will happen between, between the two countries. Uh, through through this mechanism. Uh, now that's also scientific diplomacy, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it's being done in a self-organized way in, in in some sense. And of course, that can be taken much further by meetings like this and by organizations um, in the government and in Delhi. Uh, I also uh, wanted to uh, bring out uh, just one last couple of points is that uh, the 21st century actually demands new types of approaches to vaccine development. And, um, and I think, you know, while India has done extraordinarily well with the conventional vaccines, I think we'd love to see the industry move into sort of these new emergent technologies. And, and uh, there's sort of three different approaches that seem to be working in, in the vaccine space. Um, one is, uh, you know, actually using structure-based approaches where you actually use structural properties of the virus to, actually, to come up with, with vaccine designs. And for RSV, which is the respiratory uh, syncytial uh, uh, virus, uh, there is a vaccine now, I think, in phase one, which is so showing very robust uh, immunogenicity. Um, for the influenza viruses, which, as we all know, uh, because of rapid mutations, your, the viruses keep changing. And so there you need something that's a very rapid prototyping uh, platform for, for developing vaccines. And 
their uh, mRNA based or gene based vaccine platforms are starting to show some results uh, for at least two influenza pandemics they've been able to uh, scientists have been able to develop uh, new vaccine constructs and then i think there was already some mention of the m72 tb uh, vaccine in in chennai and that is a new platform again, a technology that is using recombinant uh, antigens with, uh, uh, with you know, adjuvants to, to be able to, to, to treat uh, some of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, difficult and uh, comorbidity related uh, TB uh, situations. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll stop, but uh, be happy to uh, engage in discussion later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Chandru, for your very informative input. Let us move now to the next presentation, Dr. Manish Sridhar from the WHO Regional Office. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have a presentation, if you may permit. I have just got it loaded for clarity. And uh, ये वाली presentation नहीं है इसको बंद कर दीजिए it's loaded the wrong one anyway uh, we will take uh, I will just uh, speak few points uh, the first important point I thought I would like to make is that uh, in terms of influenza viruses in fact it was the WHO gistris system which came about very early on in the 1950s and the story of vaccine development within WHO is actually in, a, in many ways uh, goes hand in hand with the story of the development of WHO itself. And when we look at the uh, culmination of some of the discussions which have taken place in the pandemic influenza preparedness virus uh, mechanism that was developed by WHO uh, very recently in 2011, uh, this was the first time that in terms of the vaccine, they were looking at the concept of benefit sharing. And this is one of the first uh, uh, biological materials in terms of benefit sharing that has come up for discussions under both the Convention of Biodiversity and the Nagoya Protocol. And to this extent also we need to bear in mind that vaccine has actually promoted a lot of discussions in terms of uh, these new uh, intergovernmental arrangements in terms of access and benefits in the WHO. Having said that, uh, I have a few points to make, and in fact, this is the presentation I had given up uh, for loading. Uh, we very recently, as you know, we had the universal health coverage high-level political declaration, which took place on 23rd of September in 2019, very recently in New York, and it was uh, signed by all the top uh, high-level uh, political representatives. And in that declaration, which is uh, more than 90 paragraphs, uh, vaccines was discussed in great detail and particularly in the context of uh, at achieving universal health coverage. And when we talk about the WHO's role in universal health coverage, we find that uh, uh, we have uh, the targets, uh, uh, there are 13 targets under the Sustainable Development Goal Target 3, which looks at health. But more importantly, vaccine is very important, which is looking at a means of implementation of universal health coverage. And to that extent, uh, the access to medicines and vaccines has, has, been, tar has been outlined as a, as a separate, uh, uh, separate deliverable under the Sustainable Development Goals and the implementation that is being, uh, uh, th that is being tracked. Having said that, uh, I uh, very recently uh, in 2019, which was just last year, and also in preparation of the universal health coverage uh, agenda of the UN, which took place in New York, uh, there was an access to medicines and vaccines World Health Assembly resolution, which was uh, 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 supported by all 192 member states of WHO. And in this medicines and vaccines uh, resolution, access uh, to vaccines and medicines talked about regulatory system strengthening. And regulatory system strengthening, when it looks as medicines and vaccines, builds very heavily from vaccines also into medicines because of the fact that vaccines 
has been uh, uh, a part of uh, intergovernmental engagement since very early on, as I said, in 1950s in the WHO. So uh, there, is, uh, there are a number of activities in WHO, uh, in the regional offices that we are engaged in to produce uh, uh, synergies in terms of access to vaccines. And in terms of the WHO Southeast Asia Regional Office, from where I come from, I am the focal point for the Southeast Asia Regulatory Network, which is a network of all regulators in the region. There are 11 countries in Southeast Asia region, three of them. Yeah, this is the presentation. So maybe we can go on to slide six. Yes, so uh, uh, in terms of regulatory strengthening, we have uh, now a Southeast Asia <coughs> regulatory network, and the countries decided to uh, leverage on the large pool of regulatory expertise which is there in the region to look at how to bring access to vaccines and medicines into the market. So what typically happens in the, is that when a new vaccine is introduced, for example, the Rotavac vaccine, it is the regulator which has to give permission at uh, every level, even at the level of clinical trials and then for the final introduction of the vaccine into the market. And it was felt that each regulator is wasting a lot of time to look at the dossiers from the very beginning. And can we have a CTD, a common technical dossier submission at the level of introduction into the market, and also a common technical application at some stage uh, when we look at the vaccine introduction. So having said that, uh, just uh, the next slide, please. Uh, these are a number of World Health Assembly resolutions that built into the, uh, the uh, reason why CERN has been started in the Southeast Asia region. We are fortunate we have three countries from the ASEAN region, uh, Thailand, Malaysia, um, um, uh, Thailand, Myanmar, and Indonesia. So they bring a lot of expertise in terms of their uh, efforts on common technical dossier review that they are undergoing, uh, have a committee in ASEAN. And very recently in Bangkok, uh, the CERN looked at a common technical dossier re review in terms of a common uh, dossier collaborating procedure, the CRP procedure, for uh, hepatitis B uh, fixed dose combinations. So while a lot of work has been going on in terms of vaccine uh, introduction uh, in terms of the individual countries, the next slide, please. There was a Delhi declaration which was signed off in, in 2018 by all the ministers of the region. And as you can see at number four, they have, while they look at all the other aspects, and they called it medical products. And the reason why they said medical products was that they found that while vaccine uh, and, and medicines are one aspect, the devices and diagnostics also have become extremely important. And in many cases, currently, the diagnostics becomes critical for the introduction of the right uh, 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 amount of, uh, particularly in the context of the antibiotics as well. Next, please. So this is the Delhi Declaration, as you can see, all the ministers had signed, which really led to strengthening the Southeast Asia Regulatory Network. Next, please. And these are the ministers that signed off. Next, please. So the objectives were information sharing, strengthening of the systems, and convergence, and finally collaboration. And uh, go ahead, please. Next slide. Uh, these are the priority issues, uh, uh, CN priorities and vaccines that have been identified. This is part of the strategic vision and the work plan. So the first thing they said was we need to strengthen vaccine reporting. We already have an AEFI system which is working well in some of the countries. In India, it is doing very well. And many of them would like to piggyback on the information that is available uh, so that the other countries don't have to maintain or, or start their own uh, 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 separate uh, uh, sets of reporting, and they can also rely on the information that is coming out uh, in terms of introduction of some of these vaccines. And then they also, they also identified that we promote vaccines in some of the vaccine preventable diseases. And uh, uh, there was a joint, uh, I think we have a number of manufacturers here and they would bear uh, us out that in Thailand last year, there was a developing countries vaccine manufacturers network and the uh, IFPMA produced uh, some, uh, uh, some guidance document which is being actively considered by all the 11 country regulators so that, so that we can have a model application form for the introduction of the vaccine, and that's, that would help us in speeding up the introduction of the vaccine into, into the markets. Next, please. So uh, this is what is happening in Africa. Uh, uh, 
Uh, while we, uh, the CERN was formed only in 2016, Africa, uh, this work uh, under the AVRF, the African Vaccine Regulatory Forum, has been, is rather, has, has been there for some time. It was established in 2006 uh, uh, in WHO for the same very reasons that we uh, started the CERN network here. And they are also looking at joint reviews. And uh, given the fact that this uh, agent, this uh, collaborative uh, effort uh, has been there in existence for some time, they, it was considerably useful when we looked at the accelerated clinical evaluation of the Ebola vaccine candidates. Uh, that was very critical. Next, please. So this is what uh, are some of the joint reviews that have been taken place by, uh, by AVRF. So we actually had the conjugate uh, meningitis A vaccine in 2006. And I'm happy to inform you that our Indian regulators contributed to this 2006 review. They were the drug regulator from India and their agencies uh, actively participated. And this also speaks of the... Uh, 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 Dr. Sachin Chaturvedri just mentioned the, uh, the science diplomacy. I think it began much before we coined this word uh, in the very beginning. And then uh, these are some of the other highlights, which uh, in the interest of time, I will not go into. But uh, given uh, the uh, currently we are looking at Article 58 of the Scientific Opinion and Risk Management Plan, also in terms of the EU, because the European Union is, is supporting this in a big way. And uh, joint reviews, as I mentioned, uh, of the Ebola vaccine uh, took place. Next, please. Uh, so uh, there is also, uh, in, uh, in April, there was a joint review for the Rotavac uh, vaccine. This is also supported, uh, apart from PATH, by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And these are some of the further activities that have taken place. Uh, Dr. Renu Sarup has been the guiding force behind uh, CEPI, which is monitoring of clinical trial processes. And uh, CEPI has contributed uh, in a big way in terms of uh, clinical trial authoriz authorization by AVRF. And uh, the objective is really to uh, this, uh, the AVRF started by about 15, 16 countries. And now, as the uh, Honorable Ambassador will bear us out, it is almost all the 55 African member states are now involved in some way or the other in the AVRF process, if not as, uh, as uh, uh, regulators on the table, but as observers. And uh, they are also looking at the use of templates for all future joint reviews of clinical trial applications. And from this year, the WHO headquarter in Geneva has encouraged the CERN network, which we are already engaged with in the Southeast Asia region, to also engage with AVRF so that there is a learning built across the organization. And we could perhaps come up with common uh, points for review uh, when, we, when uh, a, ma a manufacturer actually submits a dossier. Next one, please. So what uh, uh, it was the WHO PQ was also mentioned by Dr. Ghosh uh, in his uh, 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 very uh, comprehensive presentation. The advantage of a WHO pre-qualification, which is uh, done by the WHO team with the manufacturers, is uh, there is a capacity building for the regulators of the countries where they go ahead and do the PQ. But more importantly, it also gives a, a, a credibility to the manufacturer who's trying to, who's, who's uh, engaging in the supply of vaccines uh, across the globe. And uh, there has been consistent uh, demand to increase the uh, WHO pre-qualification uh, reviews which are done by this team uh, in, in WHO. And this is uh, some of the work in progress that is leading to uh, uh, the availability of and, and, and improving the access to vaccines. One of the points that Dr. Ghosh mentioned was that India is able to provide vaccines at a very uh, affordable price. And one of the reasons is that it's so competitive in India. The manufacturers are forced to compete with each other apart from competing in an international market, and they really bring, try to bring the best processes uh, in order to do so. Next, please. So this is it. And with these words, I thank uh, uh, Dr. Sachin uh, for uh, inviting me here. And also uh, uh, Dr. Renu Saroop, because uh, I also want to share with you that one of the uh, aspects that we are bringing up is in terms of the startups. And Dr. Renu Saroop has also initiated a program where with the regulator and the WHO, we are working to develop uh, a means where the clinical trial process is supported right from the very beginning. Uh, so that when a startup comes up, whether it is in the area of vaccines or diagnostics uh, or any of the new products, 
the, the, the young researcher doesn't have to go back on the board uh, so that uh, if certain parts of the procedure are not in order. So we, uh, how to engage with regulators from the very beginning in order to let that happen. And we have to thank the Department of Biotechnology and Dr. Renu's vision to uh, make sure that this is uh, at a very advanced stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sridhar. I'm very grateful for your cross-referencing of what's happening in the Southeast Asia region and the African continent uh, under the auspices of WHO and the good work that they do. We move on now to Dr. Rajat Goyal, Country Head, International AIDS Vaccine Initiative. I just thought I'll stand up. I was just feeling a little stuck there. Yeah. Um, so I guess I, uh, you know, it's easy to, firstly, thank you, uh, Dr. Zachinta, for having me here. And uh, and everybody's complimented Dr. Reno so much. I'm not going to add that compliments in my, in my conversation. And of course, I'm also very happy that um, uh, Dr. Rao is here. Uh, and you talk about vaccines, you can't talk about vaccines without him being there. It's been... Uh, I know, 30, 40 years of your life that you spent on vaccines. Um, and it's easy for me, for a person like me, to talk because I have a very easy role. I don't, I'm not a policymaker. I don't make policies. I represent organizations where uh, we provide the ignition to the policymakers or we sit in the driver's seat or sometimes as, uh, as, uh, as a passenger uh, trying to push the car to move fast or kind of tell the driver where to go or where not to go. Um, and fortunately, um, I guess our experience um, in the word South-South, I always get confused when people use the word South-South. Is it about India and Africa or is it, in, is it really the whole South? And, um, because obviously Africa takes the limelight, uh, so but South-South for me goes anything beyond, below the equator. Um, um, and does it include Australia and, 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 and Singapore? I guess that's always a question to be asked. Uh, but having said so, I, I usually do not like to reserve my thoughts on vaccines any longer only. Uh, I think uh, it's best to use a word called biologicals uh, because vaccines and biotherapeutics today obviously are, are the leading drivers of uh, disease management. I, I think just before the session started, people um, I did have Dr. Gandhi also mention about stem cells, but I'll keep that aside for now. Uh, but obviously there's a, a, an immense need now for vaccines and especially monoclonal antibodies and biotherapeutics, essentially because places where we can't make vaccines or we're finding difficult vaccines, uh, difficult to make vaccines, especially people talked about TB, people talked about HIV, malaria, I think the RSV, um, uh, we are essentially moving forward and trying to make better antibodies which could be used both for prevention and treatment. Um, so I just have a couple of thoughts and um, I can sometimes my thoughts could be really brash or they could be very abstract but just bear with me because I guess most of you represent different parts of the world and we have a lot of policy makers sitting across the table and we also have external affairs uh, which is NRIS which is trying to drive India towards the world and reach out to the world. Um, so it's always good to kind of represent India in a very positive limelight and say that, look, we, we, dry, we have like presented 80% of the world's supply of vaccine is, is, is supplied by us. The numbers, uh, the value numbers, I mean, the, uh, the dollar numbers don't show that, but of course the, uh, the number of wires being sold is much higher. Um, but is it going to stay? Uh, I, I always wonder, can we continue to lord in that limelight for, for years to come. I, uh, despite the Indian manufacturers increasing their production capacity, being internally competitive, but there are people around the world who are giving us a stiff competition, be it South Korea, come to China, look at Indonesia. Um, so I think we need to be cautious of that. And, and, and what is it that we should do? Is it really standard business as usual? Or we need to look at different disruptive business models? Um, while we continue on that front, um, I guess we need to address these issues for today, but the future demands something more. Uh, the diseases are changing. Um, it's no longer easy to make vaccines uh, or biotherapeutics. Um, and I think um, in, the, in the morning talk, 
there was a fifth bullet point on the last slide, uh, which talked about novel vaccines, novel therapeutics, and the kind of technologies that are needed. And is it possible or is it not possible? Can India do it? Can other countries in the South do it? Or yet we need to depend upon the West, which is galloping ahead very fast, and, and how do we reach there? Uh, and I think we should not ignore these thoughts, uh, uh, and we should be very cognizant of that. And I'd like to, in my very brief talk, uh, I wasn't prepared for, I haven't prepared any kind of a formal talk, but I'm just going to uh, volumize some uh, image uh, thoughts in my head. Uh, and this has really been, uh, been fortunate enough to work with people like Dr. Reno. Uh, and uh, of course, Dr. Uh, and Indian Council of Medical Research and External Affairs, Commerce Ministry, and a lot in the African nation. And of course, uh, both with WHO and other, uh, other groups across, across the world. Um, and um, just, um, I, I, you know, I think I personally uh, I feel very challenged on, um, although we have one giant sitting in the center, that's the World Health Organization, which kind of helps prioritize various things for everyone. But is that dynamic similar or they're changing? Uh, CEPI's coming up, they prioritize their own diseases. Countries themselves prioritize their own diseases. Uh, the endemicity uh, and the you know, the epi of, of various diseases around the world is changing. So how do you kind of end up making a unified decision which is globally applicable? And I, I, mm -hmm. I, I think that um, that's one thing that we should, we should really consider. Um, we just mentioned that, um, you know, um, a lot of the access is needed. We're looking up various groups coming together. Uh, but if you ask uh, Gavi, and they say that, we, you know, we've got 80% penetration. Now, how do we reach the remaining 20 percent? And, and uh, are there some innovative models that we want to try and people take the example of how Pepsi and Coke has reached every human being across the world, so why can't vaccines reach there? And I think uh, that's what Melinda Gates also tried to give in one of her TED Talks, but um, we, are, we are yet going there. Uh, we haven't reached there. Uh, um, and um, so is because of these dynamics, is the demand coming sufficiently in a consistent manner across individual countries or from the globe, which is allowing the manufacturers to take prioritization decisions and actually be bullish in scaling up the manufacturing potential, whether you do export or imports, um, is it helping us reach there? And, and I think that those political dynamics are also changing. Every country is becoming inclusive. Uh, there was a time when, and I'll just allude to that later in, in one of my comments, uh, on uh, when there was a demand from the African group, all the 55 countries that we're talking about, and saying that India should help setting up manufacturing plants uh, in Africa. Uh, I think a lot of the Indian manufacturers stepped back and said that we are happy to do that, provided you know not one country demands it, but a group of countries comes together and says, is there a demand and can we supply? And it, does that happen, or should we just be dependent upon a supply market? That means we look at WHO pre-qualification, we look at UNICEF procurement, and then that's the route that we take for, for en ensuring the supply. I, mean, I think that's something that uh, one really needs to consider. Um, in addition, um, I guess I'll just very quickly switch over for the next two or three minutes um, on the research side. Um, and, and I think that's important uh, because we've done the conventional vaccines. We are, we, are, we are there on trying to understand the challenges of making the conventional vaccines available, more affordable, and all the policy framework. Uh, we just had Manisha talking about the regulators and why are they coming together, how, how's the DCVM and thinking, how do they prioritize. And even if they do prioritize, can they do it? And I think that's a very fundamental question that we have to really ponder about very seriously, and we can't ignore that. Um, these diseases are getting challenging, whether you talk about viral pathogens or bacterial pathogens, and it's not, not the same, it's not as easy as it was shown in the first slide, when we talked about all the monocytes and, and the B cells and the T cells. It's so just so difficult to find a target. Uh, it's just so very difficult to make an antigen. And that too, which is globally relevant. Uh, again, the disease has changed so much that every region essentially is having a different strain of the same virus, and whatever you produce may not be applicable in that country. 
So nowadays people say, okay, like for example, in monoclonal antibodies, let's just make a cocktail of antibodies. Make one, make another applicable to different, and then see whether you can mix it together, and then can you make a globally relevant product. Can you do that for vaccines? I mean, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I think the era is over, the same thing that you experienced with RTSS in malaria, uh, same thing that the M72 is experiencing with TB, or the VPM of Serum Institute for tuberculosis vaccine. Uh, that what's the efficacy that we're looking at? It's no longer 90%, 100%, no, no longer the same way. I mean, are we going to be satisfied to introduce a preventative vaccine which has just 50% or less than 50%? South Africa looks at an HIV TB very differently and say you get a 35, 40% efficacy and we'll introduce it. You know, but can WHO come out with a recommendation as a policy recommendation for that? I mean, I think we experienced that with malaria and RTSS is not a global vaccine today. JSK is uh, not interested in taking up the M72 further only for that reason, because they want to kind of externalize and third party uh, manufacturing of all that. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just kind of, um, you know, telling you these facts because I think these are very important for us to be cognizant of and be aware on how to how to how do we come together uh, because there are solutions to everything partnerships can handle everything uh, effective policies which address these challenges are important and and they can address all these issues uh, so making an applicable product is going to be very very key and what have been our experiences so far in south to south i just kind of allude to that uh, we started with ipsa which was mentioned here right 2001, Mr. Kapil Sibyl, when he was the science minister, he signed that. Uh, and uh, one person whom we miss in a gathering like this is Professor Bhan, right? Obviously, he's somebody who took, took it from uh, a great leadership forward um, and then carrying that leadership um, and, and much brighter, I think, is what Dr. Rain was doing. And so, uh, thank you. Uh, I think a lot that <laughs> Uh, in the science diplomacy that we owe today is both to Department of Biotechnology, Department of Science Technology, and Indian Council of Medical Research. We can't forget them because obviously they're contributing a lot and taking a lead on that also. Um, um, and we thank External Affairs Ministry because they keep pushing, you know, keep pushing, go there, go there, do it, do it. And, and I think that's very helpful. And um, so um, IPSA started, but scientists never knew how to come together under the IPSA framework. It had like 20, 25 things. And I think both Dr. Reno and Dr. Rao and other folks from DBT will say that. I mean, you know, what was really IPSA? And then uh, we go to the DST secretary and he says, like, it's just too broad. Can you guys be more specific? And then people came together. And then was it possible to bring India, South Africa, and Brazil together? I mean, I think they were all political dynamics there. So finally, India and South Africa come together because they're better aligned. And Brazil and India go together because they're more aligned in manufacturing. So where does IPSA kind of bring people together? So, but great, it's been 15, uh, 10 years now that India and South Africa are working together. And I think the first six years when DST asked the question, what have you guys achieved? We said we made the researchers learn how to work together. You know, I mean, forget the impact of the science, but I think it was important to first bring the people together and just, you know, mitigate that culture. Uh, otherwise, it's just too inclusive. It's it, this is mine, not yours. And, you know, it's saying to us saying this is ours, and I think that that transformation was very key. The same thing is happening in all research collaboration. You do it with Netherlands, you do it with the United States, you do it with anybody. I think just the culture of trying to work together was very important, um, and yet. You know, all the three nations, at least in health science, haven't come together I mean, as, as of today. I mean, just yet more people feel more comfortable with bilateral working relationships than, than a trilateral or a multilateral relationship. Um, so we need to, do need to kind of push that and, and, you know, and, and get that out of the window. But what are these regions very comfortable in coming together on? Um, anything that promotes the understanding of the population and the diseases in the population together, they're very comfortable. Something that has been promoted a long time back from the West because they wanted to make the products, it's yet the comfort zone. But I think thankfully the technologies and the understanding of the disease and the population dynamics between these regions have become so powerful and being used now, whether through artificial intelligence or through genomics platform, like what was being referred to by Chand Dr. Chandru. I think that's a very common ground, and that has a very key role, both to make better products and to determine the best of the product. 
what is an ideal product that can really be used in the population. So this is one area where people are very, very comfortable. And I think um, when the Prime Minister announced about uh, you know, the India-Africa Forum and there was a promotion on the health sciences front, I think there was a big meeting that happened several, a couple of years back, and an India-Africa Health Sciences Platform was created, led by ICMR, Department of Biotechnology, External Affairs Ministry, and Ministry of Commerce. Uh, Commerce Ministry and External Affairs kept on punching and says, manufacturing, get us India and Africa to, to kind of set up that manufacturing capacity. And it hasn't happened. Uh, it'll happen for trade, but it's not happening for manufacturing. So how do you promote that? And I think repeatedly the manufacturers just kept coming back and saying, look, there's some groups which have opened plants in Egypt, right? But why is it not becoming a bullish thing? Why is South Africa looking at now setting up their own manufacturing plants? And, um, you know, trying it out with TB, uh, trying it out with some other drug products. Uh, so how can India help there? You know, there's the issue about, we have recently heard about snake bite. It's not about infectious disease, it's snake bite. It's a big problem, right? So uh, South Africa, I mean, an, an anti-snake venom serum is, is, is a paucity in, in India. It's a paucity in South Africa. So what is it that that partnership could bring in? I think these are some, some thoughts that keep on emerging, but we need to put our ears on the ground and listen. And I think that's my only encouragement to the policymakers and to the people here, that if you listen well, maybe you can ram out with more creative and disruptive solutions which bring people together. Uh, because it's not going to help us to just cap, keep on carrying out on business as usual. And this was our experience, again, on through the India-Africa Health Sciences Platform. It's 55 countries in Africa. It's not South-South only. <laughs> not the only South-South that I talked about. Uh, and India. Um, and then you go into Africa and say, oh, there's West Africa, there's Central Africa, there's East Africa, and then there is South Africa, right? And then everybody says, like, you know, if you're talking about, keep South Africa out, right? They're, they're different, and let's talk about others, right? So I guess we should look into this, and I'd like to just close on the fact that uh, having population-based studies, um, having product intervention studies, having evaluation of all that, um, and having technologies and partnerships which we can do with the West, uh, along with the South-South, can actually help us accelerate product development, and that's what the industry is also looking for. So thank you very much. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Goya. You've uh, raised a number of uh, key issues, some provocative, and I hope we can get an opportunity to take some of these discussions further. Uh, let's move to the last uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Jain. Uh, you have seven minutes, uh, Dr. Jain. Hi, good afternoon, and thank you very much for inviting me on this uh, forum, a very vital case study. Uh, very highly obliged to Dr. Ghosh and the organizers. First of all, please, Dr. Ghosh, accept my uh, congratulations on a comprehensive work done on bringing out this case study on the Indian vaccine industry. Not only Indian vaccine industry, but the role played by all key stakeholders in this entire exercise of making India uh, such a proud uh, vaccine industry, which is actually exporting more than 66% of its vaccine across the globe. This work actually not only recognizes the contribution of the Indian private sector vaccine, but also showcases its present as well as future capability. Once you go through in details, which we also saw a glimpse when Dr. Ghosh was presenting, and not only that, but also recognizes the role being played by large pharmaceutical multinational companies in India, and more so importantly, how uh, global stakeholders like UNICEF, Gavi, WHO, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Rotary, USAID, has contributed in really making the country successful in elimination of so many diseases, but at the same time covering immunization at large in the country. This work also illustrates the efforts made by Department of Biotechnology, 
Ministry of Science and Technology, ICMR, in making the field of vaccines innovative in India and providing money on the table for the private sector, individual research scientists and universities across the country. It is a first time attempt which has been made to define the real cost of immunization per child. I have not seen such a work done before and also the amount of wastage that the current national immunization program is actually doing which is worth noting and probably will, uh, will uh, motivate all of us to look at how to reduce that. This report actually lays a lot of foundation for further research to be done. In my view, when I was going through again and again last couple of days, it is definitely a good foundation, especially uh, to uh, discuss in much more detail the value that was created by Government of India in encouraging the manufacturing sector in India and also at the same time undertaking not so uh, good investments that public sector, uh, government of India made in public sector which could not really come to fruition, especially keeping in mind all the developing country manufacturers that we see here from Latin America and Africa and also from CS republics who want to actually have the appetite of making a local manufacturing setup in those countries. So that can be a good guide to them whether is it encouraging private sector investment in this sector would be more viable or putting government money and doing things and competing with the private sector? Is price control necessary for private market when the entire mission of making vaccines available is being given by government free of charge? Should the private sector not be left alone to pursue research, put their money, bring innovative vaccines in the country which are out of price control? I think debates like this can be started from this uh, paper. Whether acellular pertussis, which you mentioned as part of your whole research, is that a good vaccine for the developing world? Definitely not, especially looking into the waning immunity which is happening across US and the European markets. What could also be highlighted in further research is the role of veterinary vaccines that uh, is, uh, is played especially in, for diseases which migrate from animals to humans. And I'm so encouraged by looking at this publication that to promote biotechnology in India, a chapter in schools and universities could be created out of this uh, position paper uh, to really showcase how Indian vaccine industry, including public sector, has created value in you know, uh, eradicating polio from India, fighting the war of measles and looking at new vaccine, which will encourage students to pursue biotechnology as a career. When I look at uh, from the Indian vaccine industry, which is actually producing more than a billion doses every year, supplying to more than 125 countries across the world, which is almost 66% of the you know, consumption of vaccine and every second child out of three is getting a vaccine made by an Indian vaccine company. We look at actually globalizing. There are two options that each manufacturer has on his account. Keep putting more facilities in your own country or look at expanding your production base across the world. While putting up more facilities is always an option and obvious, but probably not the best strategy that any company has to follow. So we are looking at actually placing out our production facilities in different parts of the world, especially looking into the global annual birth cohort is close to 133 million children, which are born every year on this earth, out of which 43.4 million children are born in Africa, close to 10.5 in Latin America, and there is a huge number in CIS republics as well. We are looking at critical partnerships in different parts of the world to actually tie up with manufacturers local to produce these vaccines locally. But what does that mean? Which means that when we look at any country as in our production base, for example, in Vietnam, we have tied up with a company because they seem to have some infrastructure and understanding of what would it take to produce a vaccine locally. When you look at Africa, you don't find that ecosystem existing. When you go to Latin America, maybe Brazil has that ecosystem and therefore we are trying to localize the production there. To what extent would vary from you know, country to country. But in Africa, I think a lot of work needs to be done before we 
actually think of putting up production plants there because a vaccine, raw material or active raw material that we called as the drug substance is not freely available unlike pharmaceutical which is far more you know, easy to manufacture and the standards that are expected by the regulatory bodies are far more difficult. So when we talk about putting a production basis in Africa, actually South Africa is to be treated differently because they appear to have moved on. But however, there again, the issue was private sector versus public sector. Had their initial ventures been made more private sector like, they would have been successful so far. They have not made any impact globally, but they are still struggling and a lot to do. So that's, that's what I would bring in the perspective from uh, the private sector here. We are very proud to be an Indian vaccine uh, manufacturer. We are very proud that our government has really supported us in bringing novel vaccines. And we are now keenly looking forward to bringing innovative vaccines for the first time in the world. And my request to all of you present here would be that please try and develop a fast track accessibility system with manufacturers in India who have got WHO pre-qualification so that we don't waste a lot of time in registration and access of these high quality affordable vaccines could be made at, uh, to the uh, local population in Africa, Latin America and CS republics much faster than today because the procedures are really very difficult as of now. And in several countries in Africa, the regulatory agencies are also missing or we really do not know who to go to register these vaccines. With this, I will end my thing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jane, for bringing some very important perspectives from the private sector into the discussion.